Welcome to Countering Foreign Malign Influence While Protecting Civil Liberties. Please welcome Dr. Kevin Roberts, President of the Heritage Foundation. Good afternoon and welcome to all of you here in person. Those of you online, we're, we're grateful that you're with us. We have an excellent program for you this afternoon focused on how to counter foreign malign influence while protecting our civil liberties as citizens of this great republic. We here at Heritage have spent years, as you know, analyzing, researching, and seeking solutions on how to combat our nation's adversaries. This includes not only tackling challenges in the near term, but long-term challenges emanating from the likes of the Chinese Communist Party, diabolical regimes in Iran, and consistently aggressive and tyrannical Putin and Russia. Adversaries such as these seek to sow discord in our populace, undermine our economic, civil, and educational institutions, and target current and future political and business leaders with malicious intent. Much of this happens right underneath our noses, and much of the time, as you know, is technically legal. So how does the federal government and other local state and business stakeholders identify and disrupt these campaigns? To begin with, this will involve needed trust and accountability in our institutions, some that have been immensely challenged in recent years. Government targeting of America's First Amendment rights is antithetical to the bedrock of our founders' intentions. At the same time, our leaders have a duty to warn and disrupt these gray zone campaigns our adversaries continue to invest time, resources, and personnel in to undermine our republic. The distinguished gentlemen joining us today serve on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio currently serves as the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee and has done an excellent job since assuming this role in highlighting the slew of national security issues that confront us as a nation, advocating for a strong and aggressive military and intelligence posture to protect our future. He has served this country in Congress since 2002, including stints leading the Armed Services Tactical Air and Land Forces, as well as the Strategic Forces Subcommittee while serving on the House Intelligence Committee since 2015. He sought to move these conversations with the American public beyond the SCIF, and we welcome here to Heritage today as part of this series for an excellent discussion. He will be joined by his colleague from Mississippi, Congressman Trent Kelly, who serves on both the House Intelligence and Armed Services Committees. Congressman Kelly has spent 36 years in the Mississippi Army National Guard as a combat engineer, where he currently serves as a major general. He's a consistent voice for our men and women in uniform and those serving in the shadows within our intelligence community. Gentlemen, welcome here to Heritage. And for those of you here live in the auditorium, please join me in welcoming Congressman Mike Turner. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, and thank you for having us here at Heritage, and I want to thank Heritage and your team uh, for being able to support uh, this effort. Um, you know, the number one thing that I've heard from our members of the Intelligence Committee on both sides of the aisle is a real need for the Intelligence Committee to return its focus back to national security. Um, all of the members are, are ready to, uh, to look at the portfolio of the Intelligence Committee. Uh, and looking at our adversaries, what are our threats, what are the risks that we're facing, and make certain that the intelligence community uh, is focused on those and that the information is getting to the intelligence committee. Beyond that, we also look to change our focus from not just national security, but a function of we don't just want to be a bunch of people in the basement at the Capitol who get told important and, and uh, you know, critical aspects of our national security. Uh, we've formulated a mission statement uh, that looks at how we can marry intelligence to policy making and decision making. We want to make certain that the information we receive uh, as actionable intelligence can come into actual action on the part of, uh, of Congress. This series that we've been uh, calling Beyond the Skiff, and we greatly appreciate Heritage hosting us, uh, is an effort to reach out to the think tank community, the uh, policy community, <clears throat> the academic community, and to entertain 
their issues and thoughts as to what we should be focusing on as we look to the future of our adversaries. Now, this issue, as Dr. Roberts was saying, is very important. Um, China, Russia, Iran, others, uh, because we're an open society, uh, look to ways in which they can undertake nefarious activities or malign activities to try to either destabilize or to influence uh, the American politic. And as Dr. Roberts was saying, it's so important, though, that in looking for these nefarious and malign activities uh, that we also do not, uh, at the same time, um, stumble in ways in which we could suppress our own dialogue, or our own debate on important issues. Um, Trent Kelly is uniquely uh, positioned in the Armed Services Committee and the Intelligence Committee of having uh, both his, his feet in both areas. Uh, that gives him a, a really solid basis. We have a look at the issues of national security and what should the Intelligence Committee be doing. And of course, uh, from his Army experience as a Major General, he brings uh, unique expertise back to both committees in addition to just the overlap. Uh, we appreciate uh, this, uh, this forum today. We look forward to the experts and uh, hearing what their recommendations are. And of course, the leadership from Tritt Kelly. I uh, appreciate uh, your conducting this today. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Roberts and the Heritage Foundation for hosting this Beyond the SCIF uh, platform. We're going to discuss a platform that discusses uh, these important and sensitive issues, and we're going to allow folks, experts, to get involved on a policy level where we can't always do in a SCIF outside of the view of the American public. I also want to thank Ranking Member Turner for his introduction and his leadership on the House Intelligence Committee. We wouldn't be here today without the leadership of Mike Turner. He has chosen to get out of the shadows and to get into the public so that we can make policy-making decisions that help us forward our intelligence community while protecting America and getting the ideas of our brightest scholars, which are not always in the skiff with us. As ranking members said, the committee is hosting a series of these events to expand our engagement with national security experts and to provide us a unique opportunity to have public discussions on key national security challenges, which are not always outside in the public to hear. Today's panel is focused on the threat of foreign malign influence activities and how the U.S. government, especially the intelligence community, should respond. This is one of the committee's oversight priorities going into the next uh, cycle. We're particularly focused on ensuring that government actions in this space do not restrict, prevent, or disrupt the First Amendment rights of American citizens. I really want to thank our panel. We have a group of experts, I think, that is very, very good. So we look forward to questions and to a forum which uh, gives us some good ideas going forward. With that, I thank you. We have panelists here today with significant national security experience. I want to get into the meat of the issues as quickly as possible. So I'm just going to provide a couple of highlights of each of the person's background, but they are all impressive with diverse experiences and their heritage webpage includes their full bios. Brian Cavanaugh is a senior vice president at American Global Strategies. He has served in several positions at the Department of Homeland Security and spent three years at the National Security Council. Craig Singleton is a senior fellow and the China Program Deputy Director at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. He has 10 plus years of government national security experience, primarily in positions focused on East Asia. Victoria Coates serves as the Senior Research Fellow at the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at Heritage. She has served as a senior advisor for several presidential candidates and has held several key positions at the National Security Council and the Department of Energy. She is also has a PhD in art history and is an expert in Italian Renaissance art. Dustin Carmack is a research fellow with heritage focused on cyber, intelligence, technology, and border security. Dustin has worked in senior positions on Capitol Hill and is chief of staff to the director of national intelligence. Thank you all for participating today. I'm going to begin with several questions to the panel, and then we will open it up to the audience for questions. 
So the first question, and I guess you guys can answer it, and I'd like for each of you to take a, a shot at it if it's in your area of expertise. How have our adversaries' intentions and capabilities changed as it relates to conducting overt and covert influence operations? And within the range of adversary foreign malign influence activity, what do you see is that current top threat? Well, <clears throat> I think first and foremost, as the world has become smaller in the digital era, there's a lot more information available to our adversaries. So they have more at their fingertips. They're able to get into the issues that are divisive in our country and continue to exploit that. Um, Greg? No, I would say that the, the Chinese are keenly focused on something they call cognitive warfare. And that's using public opinion uh, as well as psychological and legal means to achieve their, their strategic objectives. And so, so much of that relies on, um, I think, really taking advantage of all of the cleavages that exist in our regulatory and legal structures such that much of what they're doing isn't technically illegal. Uh, and so they're able to do this because they prioritize it. It's something that the United States really hasn't done. And they also get to do it because they've named it. They've sort of framed it from a Chinese perspective. They're operating with a, a unity of effort that obviously we're not. And it's just an area where I think it's great that we're starting this conversation now, uh, but it's long overdue. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Congressman Kelly and uh, Congressman Turner. Kevin, uh, for, for hosting us here today on this critical topic. One of the things that's uh, been fascinating to me is how information has gotten into the national security space, which is not some conversation we would have been having 10 years ago. But for in terms of Iran, which I'm sort of focused on this week, I mean, we had it on display last night with the Iranian president being having a long form interview on 60 Minutes in which he was allowed to give all of his talking points to millions and millions of Americans. And one of the things he did that I thought was the most pernicious, and I had to think about this for a while because there was a lot of pernacity going on, uh, was when asked about the Holocaust, uh, he didn't come right out and say there was no Holocaust. He came out and said, well, you know, I guess there is some evidence that it might have happened. So, you know, why would the Jewish community or the Israelis be so against a real investigation into this? Be, I mean, and, and it's it's really the most malign thing you can imagine. He's suggesting he's the reasonable one. And those who actually do think that there was a Holocaust are somehow unreasonable and against research. That's the kind of messaging we are allowing because of our First Amendment uh, to, to be broadcast on our airwaves. And figuring out how we address that, I think, is, is critical. So I really appreciate your including us in the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. Uh, you know, all of our panelists have, have brought up things that I sincerely agree with. Um, one of the things that I think where, if you look at what China is doing in the space, is operating in that, that data environment in which they have so many touch points. And this goes everything from genetic DNA data to think about, and this has happened over the course of time. There was the Equifax hack you know, several years ago where it stole immense amounts of data of everyday Americans. You saw the OPM hack where essentially you took tons of government employees' data. And, and you look at the, these different hacks and the different, uh, a lot of this they just buy on the open market too. And that's the other wild thing is data from Americans just being purchased on the open market, which I can tell you for a fact they do not have a good intentions for this data in the long term. And so where we see the Chinese are able to do things that maybe the Russians and others weren't able to do over the course of time is use all the levers of their powers. And that is heavily in the economic space and more now in the near term uh, in technology and military uh, to quickly catch up with the United States and use these types of valves to not only affect everyday American speech, but they are highly impacting third world and developing countries that we are not currently combating in any, any substantive fashion. Yeah, and, and I think that's a difficult thing. In a democracy or a republic, you have the opportunity to, uh, to, to have the First Amendment and to speak your mind, but you have people taking advantage of that, uh, i.e. in Russia right now, they're not getting both sides of the story. They're only getting the Russian, what Putin tells them is going on in the world. So while protecting our First Amendment rights and also protecting our national security, and you mentioned China, Russia, and Iran as three of the primary people. I think we just need to highlight that. I think sometimes the American people don't realize the real threats we uh, see from those three countries. Are there, are there any other countries that you would name in addition to those three? 
Well, North Korea, but they're less, they're not as good at it uh, for various reasons. But those, those are the big three. I guess Venezuela sometimes plays in that space, Cuba. Uh, go around, around the axis of evil. Okay, thank you. And, and how is the U.S. government currently postured to counter these threats? And while you're talking about that, uh, a lot of attention has been given to interference with elections. And you can also talk about if you see any foreign malign influence as a broader threat beyond the uh, election cycles, but also elections. Well, I think, <clears throat> thank you, Congressman. The, 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 the key here is there is a distinction between interference and influence. And, and it is a very gray line that separates the two of them. I think one of the things you'll hear the panelists, including myself, talk about is thresholds. We have adversaries that understand our thresholds for rule of law, and they operate just below the threshold. Uh, in terms of the policy that exists out there and how we use that and execute on that, uh, in the election space, um, Executive Order, I think, 13848 uh, from 2018, uh, defined for the first time what election interference is and provided some categories and tools for the, <clears throat> the government to use to go after not only foreign states, but individuals that are operating in this space to covert uh, influence in that, in that area. Um, I would argue right now there's a lack of unity of effort and identifying it. We, that's the most important thing we can take away from this is educating the American people as to what we're seeing. We, inside the SCIF space, are seeing m massive amounts of information and how it's being manipulated, how it's being used, but there's no one out with credibility sharing that message. And, I'm going to use an anecdotal story real quick. Uh, in 2020, in October of 2020, uh, Iran was doing a pretty well thought out, a um, little bit JV in, the, in its approach, but uh, in a, where they bought and used US citizen data to formulate this campaign to misinform folks in, in a, on the basis of Proud Boys. Um, I think the quickest turnaround ever I've seen from the intelligence community to go from understanding what they were seeing to speaking to the American people. In, in less than 96 hours, we went from seeing something in extremely classified channels to having the director of the FBI, the director of the ODNI, and the director of CISA in front of the American people and having a conversation about what it is they saw. And, and that lends itself to the transparency and credibility that this, this issue needs to be confronted with. Yeah, I would just say, I think there are silos of excellence throughout the U.S. government looking at this, but often they aren't communicating with one another, and that there, in many cases, is maybe too much information, to Brian's point, but not enough analytic acumen to say, how do we take this and make this actionable? How can we take something that we think is actually classified, but isn't, and share that with the right stakeholders? Is it academia? Is it the media, the, the general public? We haven't built that muscle memory, and we've sort of lost it because we used to do this routinely during the Cold War, uh, particularly during the, uh, the Reagan administration. Uh, we were constantly thinking about Russian active measures. And I think one of the challenges we sort of face now in this multipolar environment is that the tactics used by each of the adversaries is sort of very different. Um, you know, I love reading and learning from Victoria because she'll explain to me how the Russians are shock and awe. Um, and I think the Chinese, it's, it's sort of like Brian mentioned, low and slow just below the threshold of illegality, just below what they know where our intelligence resources and capabilities are. And so that doesn't say that it's low intensity. It's very, very high intensity. But there's a deliberate focus on slowly shaping our behaviors and how we think about these issues. And I think the biggest challenge that we're sort of facing is actually too much, too many targets, too much information, and not enough analysis uh, the acumen there and not, an, not enough platforms to share it uh, with the right stakeholders. And it, this is where we're sort of falling short. Thank you. Well, and I think in terms, uh, Congressman, your, your question about how we're postured to deal with this, it, 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 the answer is extremely poorly. And I think that the answer is going to have to come from what probably would be an NSC initiative. This is what the NSC actually should be doing. Uh, is both reviewing classification process, which I understand uh, that they are actually get, getting after that piece, but then also how we spread our own information. And we have you know, an extraordinary amount of, of money uh, coming out of the Congress for the USA uh, uh, Global Media Agency, uh, which encompasses Voice of America, the Radio Free Franchises, the Middle East Broadcast networks of which I was the proud president for six weeks uh, at the end of the administration. So I learned all about it, enough to be dangerous. But we have all these things. We had the Global Engagement Center at the GEC. It's not 
clear, I mean, not clear, they're not doing it. They're not coordinating together. There is no central authority uh, on, on how that information is disseminated. And in the case of something like Middle East Broadcast, we didn't even, we did, had no English presence and we were prohibited from broadcasting into the United States uh, by, our own, by our own charter. So the uh, American taxpayers who are generously funding that thing to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year have no way to evaluate the product or see if that's information they might find interesting. Uh, and so that reforming that uh, through the Congress, I think, is enormously important and work we can get after now. I thought Craig, Craig's uh, comment that there are silos of excellence in the government was spot on. And the problem is, is you know, and I, I came from ODI and i where the, the goal is to actually break down those silos, but this shows you exactly where that debate is because uh, the National Defense Authorization actually mandated a center to be uh, created several years ago to tackle just that. And I was, you know, a front row participant watching that debate play out, which I think is still going on in Congress uh, just uh, to this day about what that will look like. Because at the end of the day, the Congress has, and I, coming as a, as a former Hill rat into the executive, Congress has done a very good job of, of piling a lot of money to understand and study and resource issues. What I don't think has happened, though, is ever a channeling of actually using the resources that we have in place, and this goes to the executive side as well, of actually applying them properly and breaking down those silos. And so, you know, sadly, I think some of them still exist because there are, there's a question of the definitions in which they exist. That, that question that Brian and others brought up of influence versus uh, interference is a key one. And this was brought up, uh, you know, the National Intelligence Office for Cyber, uh, Officer for Cyber uh, brought this up in a dissent, you know, in the community, which dissent should be encouraged, actually. You know, it's not a bad thing. I think we've kind of gotten out of this practice, um, which I, what I saw from an analytic side and in the community of saying, okay, it's okay for a different agency to disagree. And it, that's important for members and stakeholders to understand why. And so where we go in the space, I think it's going to, you know, sadly have to drive a lot of this into action as, as members really putting a, 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 some spotlight on how this is happening agency by agency and making sure that analytic products represent, the, you know, the things that they need to do and see to authorize programs properly. And just real quickly, if one of you guys will take a stab at this, what is the difference between interference and influence? If you can take a, a stab at that, you know, most Americans are sitting here and we're talking in these words, but uh, define, if someone will take a stab at defining that, please. I'm going to look at Craig on that. <laughs> no way. <Yeah. laughs> Brian. Uh, this was a challenging one, even in real time. I think on our end, going back to, I was running election security for the NSC for three years and looking at all the information out there and understanding what is acceptable. And for from where I'm sitting and the way we interpret that is, overtly acknowledging and owning that, that that idea, that concept was yours. That That's free speech. There's ownership of that idea. There's ownership of what you're saying. It's when it becomes the covert, you're trying to influence through means that are not you. Uh, example, um, a community uh, accepting funding for development from China and then that community being very pro one position. They're being pro that position because we know in the intelligence community, there's being coercion influence there to have that opinion. But the American public who's seen that in their local community doesn't realize there's an outside hand tipping the scale. That That's where we got to the interference piece. I think that was a very good stab at it, so thank you. Uh, there have been numerous missteps, such as the creation of the DHS Disinformation Governments Board and allegations of FBI officials pushing a narrative that the Hunter, Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation. Situations like these have led to a credibility issues for our government. Going forward, what does the government need to do to reset and develop an appropriate foreign malign influence strategy? I, I would chime in. I think one of the biggest issues we're facing is a transparency challenge, um, particularly on the China front. Uh, everything that we're seeing is, is happening in plain sight. But our, our legal structure and U.S. code hasn't necessarily caught up with the fact that the Chinese, for example, don't need to, and for example, recipients of Chinese money, particularly in the university space, don't need to disclose that they received it. If you're operating um, as a media platform for the Chinese Communist Party, there it, it isn't technically legal that you have to uh, sort of disclose publicly where your funding streams are coming from or what your uh, editorial intent is. And so I think as we start to sit back and ask ourselves, even in the lobbying space here in Washington, D.C., plenty of very, very powerful Chinese firms like Huawei and 
Tencent and ByteDance have some of the best lobbyists on K Street, including former IC officials on their payroll. Should that be allowed? And so I think part of the challenge becomes uh, through a force of transparency. Um, there are many, I would say, US or American enablers here helping on the foreign malign space. And until that there's some uh, risk to their operations and to their reputation by forced disclosure of their activities, I think that the, the IC and the, the US public in general is sort of ill-served. Well, just to sort of uh, piggyback off of that, I think the transparency issue is, is critical both for exposing what they're doing and for making what we might be doing legitimate. And, you know, there is, there is the temptation to say, well, we're telling the truth, so our message will get out there. We know that's not true, that, that the old adage is that the lie goes around the world twice while the truth is still putting on its shoes. So I think coordinating our efforts to push narratives which have the added advantage of being true, but doing so in a radically transparent way. Uh, and and so I think that that is another step we could take uh, to, to counter this. Um, I'll, uh, this is going to be one of my many white whale issues, but um, this kind of gets into that accountability piece, you know, of, of where, you know, Americans have an, a very keen view and a respectful view and an insightful view of the information that they are receiving that's direct without analytical commentary um, by the, the proper you know, orchestra of government that, that you know, needs to be telling the information. And, and we saw that in the 2020 cycle. Um, and this, this, a lot of times, you know, my old boss used to say this, the DNI Ratcliffe, you know, a lot of times we had members just as much politicizing intelligence at times than, than you know, so essentially, you know, Craig mentioned like some people helping drive some of these things is, is really where our foreign adversaries want us to go is actually kind of causing us to be at our throats. And so I think it's also behooves members and members of the executive branch to be very keenly aware of their actions. And this goes to, you know, on the executive side, what, what grinds my axis is leaks, selective leaks of information. Um, and this goes, sometimes it's good intentions even uh, by somebody over at the Department of Defense or the intelligence community says, hey, here's this ex reporter I'm gonna leak this little nugget to without any kind of you know, ability to actually call what that is or not. And so when we're talking about downgrading intelligence information in a fashion that can be delivered to the American people in a timely manner that people feel like is articulate versus you know, X source said this and it's one cherry picked piece of intelligence that drives this narrative that I wanna drive because these all play into a broader theme of what our adversaries want us to do. And so, I, you know, when it comes to prosecuting leakers and, and, um, and those that uh, abuse uh, classified information, it is keen on my list. I agree. As a former district attorney, I assure you I agree with that. Do you have any comments? I, I just think uh, for the U.S. government officials that are going to have to carry that water when the time comes, credibility is the most important thing you have to trade on. And too often today we're seeing people take cheap shots or put themselves in compromising positions that jeopardize their credibility when it comes time to have to carry that message to the American people. Yeah, and I, I think one of the most important things for me here is just highlighting uh, that on a government level, China is using malign influence here in the United States, whether it's through our universities or businesses or buying up farmland, all the things that they're doing. And I think for so long, America turned a blind eye uh, to, to all that, just uh, refusing. And I think the fact that our citizens now are starting to see some of this, maybe they'll ask the question, where is this money coming from? What do they want? And so I think that's very important, all the things that y'all brought up. Looking into the 2023 and beyond, what are your recommendations for executive and or legislative branch action, particularly as it relates to roles and activities of the intelligence community and the appropriate civil liberty, liberty guardians? Guardrails, sorry. I think there's two that pop to mind for me. First is uh, FARA reform. Um, I think it, you can think of it almost as a defensive capability. Should former senior executive branch officials or intelligence officials be able to you know, clock out on Friday from the US government and then go on Monday and go work for Huawei? Huawei is a great example because some of their most senior most officials uh, were very, very, very senior U.S. government officials uh, back in the back in the day, and you start to see this revolving door. And so I think thinking through disclosure and thinking through constraints on the ability, which could be done through U.S. code, to inhibit I think that flow 
of expertise and talent and at least putting a, a real five to 10 year gap on it um, will really inhibit the ability of these Chinese companies to operate and to, I think, to leverage that former USG experience. And I, I think at least from the IC side, I mean, open source intelligence has always been treated as the black sheep of the IC, right? We're here to collect secrets, and they're right. Um, but increasingly, so much of what we're talking about here is occurring in the open source space. And we are not only not collecting on it, we aren't analyzing it, and we aren't pushing out that knowledge. And so when we talk about what Russia's doing on Facebook or what the Chinese are doing in the media space, it, that's overt. It's open source. We should have teams of people being able to look at it, analyze it, understanding it, and then pushing just their analysis, which is wholly unclassified, uh, to the right stakeholders so that people can see, as Dustin mentioned, should I believe what I'm seeing here? Is this from a legitimate source? And how is the adversary attempting to shape my views? Because at least from the Chinese perspective, they call it cognitive warfare, guys, warfare. They want, the battlefield is our minds. It's not so much they want to influence what we think, it's how we think and how we act. And because they use the word warfare, we need to take it very seriously. I think that's such a great point. Uh, interference and influence, both by definition, are overt. They are open source in many cases. And I do think uh, we need to take that from a second tier to a, a first tier priority for our IC. Yeah. Anyone? I would just, uh, again, piggybacking off of Craig, stealing all of his good good ideas. Uh, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but but in terms of what the Chinese are weaponizing, I mean, it's everything from TikTok to your doorbell. Uh, so I think we need a very thorough review of how all of that works. But one area I would particularly recommend for for congressional oversight is the gaming space. They are using uh, you know online gaming, which is not I had learned just playing solitary anymore. Uh, it, <laughs> the whole new world out there. But they're using that to, to train people, to train people's minds, to get you to work, work through their war games so they can see how different people react. And there's going to be a security aspect to that as well that is significant and I think will have the information and influence piece built into it. So somewhere else, uh, I think we're going to have to pay more attention than we might have thought. As you're talking 2023 and beyond. I mean, one of the things I would say is actually looking back at 2022 and stop the bleeding because uh, recently passed legislation. I mean, and I know some members felt differently about it uh, for some of its positive aspects, but the Chips Plus Science Act is a perfect example of something that we had an opportunity to do a lot of these types of guardrail type of discussions. In fact, Senator Rob Portman led an entire investigation on the Confucius Institutes and different Chinese meddling on college campuses around the country built a bipartisan bill out of it, and then between, you know, shotgun to start, between last year and this year, DOJ scrapped the DOJ China initiative. They said that his uh, measure was essentially targeting, uh, you know, for racist overtones, uh, Asian Pacific Americans, which is false. And essentially, he was told that his bill was going to be part of the CHIPS Plus Science Act and then had to find out on the back end of it after the motion to proceed that it was gone. And so we, we're missing opportunities, and I think Congress and, and you know, depending on if there's a change in Congress, uh, they should be revisiting these types of measures and putting those back on, on President Biden's desk and saying you should sign this. And I, I think just to, to piggyback on that oversight issue, when, um, I think there's two reports due with, around elections, one election infrastructure and the other one with influencing and, and what was the outcome of those efforts on elections. When you look at the malign influence space, who, who's connecting the dots between the malign influence that's, that we're experiencing day in and day out and how that pairs with their efforts on critical infrastructure, how that pairs with efforts in local governments, and, and what are the connecting dots there that we're missing? I feel like there's something in that space where whether there's a lack of connectivity between the different silos in the intelligence community that are working these issues that we're just not putting these together to understand the holistic picture. Very good. And both Russia and China have carried out aggressive disinformation campaigns in the past two years. Russia cyber actors targeted Ukraine with false messages that President Zelensky committed suicide or was planning to surrender. There are also Russian campaigns focused on legitimizing the Russian presence in occupied villages. And we all remember the false Russian narrative that there were U.S. bioweapon labs in Ukraine. Similarly, China carried out disinformation campaigns in the aftermath of COVID to include that the U.S. military was responsible for releasing the virus. Uh, give me some thoughts on those or other ways that they are using malign influence. 
I might, I might just start with, with Ukraine that I think uh, doing an after action uh, sort of lessons learned report on the entire Ukraine operation from basically the fall of Kabul through whatever uh, the conclusion of the war is, is, is critically important because I think, you know, the Russians sold the broader narrative that they were 200 feet high and we're going to take Kiev in three days and, and everybody believed it, including, you know, our intelligence community. So I think, I think going back through that so we can start to trace those patterns and, you know, and the rhythm of it uh, is, is really, is really going to be crucial to prevent it from happening again. Uh, cause, cause we, we probably missed some pretty big opportunities early in the war to uh, much more aggressively respond to Russia and, and beat them, which is what's happening now, but it, it's kind of happening incrementally and almost accidentally, uh, but for the bravery, bravery of the Ukrainians. So I think that that's a very important subject to get after for the Russians. Yeah, and kind of along that line, if you guys will talk about what the IC, the intelligence community, can do to kind of combat these things, or what should we be doing when these types of misinformation uh, happen? I think on the China side, one of the key challenges, and the COVID example I think is a great one, is you know the Chinese are very interested in stakeholder mapping. And they, they have a particular operation set and a series of objectives here for the United States that serve their both short-term and limited objectives. So everything from, as Dustin mentioned, they were, they were heavily involved in uh, influencing uh, the CHIPS Act and what came out of that. You know, uh, so it limited in short-term and a very specific policy option and objective. But then they have these much longer-term um, sort of campaigns that they will staff for decades. Uh, and their targets are uh, varied. They are everything from very influential individuals here in the United States to specific groups, but also the general public, um, targeting them both selectively and I think serially, which is really important. The challenge is the Chinese are also doing this overseas. And I think as we talk about um, you know, the future of great power competition and what a strategic rivalry with China looks like. We're also, in, a, in essence, winning hearts and minds in other countries. And the Chinese recognize this as well. They're heavily engaged in the, the media influence space. And I think the challenge that we sort of face is, you know, who's, whose responsibility within the IC is it to watch what's happening here in the United States? And where does the line sort of uh, come for what's happening abroad? Uh, and it might require as much as we would like to have you know, a centralized NOCUS like within the IC that's looking at all of this, it might require, you know, CIA analysts looking at the, the foreign piece and then others from DHS and FBI and NCSC, which is um, totally not utilized to its maximum potential, um, thinking about the domestic stakeholders. And it does sort of require that framing. Uh, I think one big thing uh, that I sort of learned uh, in my time in government is when Congress can direct funds that are fenced, uh, it's very hard for the bureaucracy to fight back, as I think we sort of mentioned here. So do you establish a, you know, a CIAP or a CIA program that's specifically focused on this one thing um, and where the money can't be rediverted to these other priorities? Uh, and I think that sometimes you can weaponize the bureaucracy against the bureaucracy. Thank you. I think that fencing is very important. Um, I was going to touch, um, one of the things we need to grapple with, that uh, we are behind the eight ball, uh, especially as it relates to China, but also to Russia to an extent, is uh, our accommodation and understanding of the future use of artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, that, that's happening, playing out, as you know, well know, in, in the DOD space of, of how, you know, put, Humpty Dumpty gets put together. Um, but separate to that, you know, ARPA and DARPA are doing some interesting work on looking at this kind of information warfare type of game and, and trying to understand quickly um, not only ways for us to see what our adversaries are working on and underlying uh, capabilities technology-wise to see that, but also at the end of the day, we also want to be able to make sure we get messages and, and people maybe have access to tools uh, in China, in Iran, in these places that are going to be over time going to be completely closed off to outside information. I mean, you see Russia and China further moving into the space of shutting down VPN, shutting down access to outside kind of information. And so these information flows is how they stay in existence. And so how do we build those capabilities and technologies to assist with that? I mean, Sp SpaceX and Starlink with what's happening in Ukraine has significantly helped the ability of Ukraine to push out messages of what was happening behind the scenes there, or just staying in close communication from an actual 
defense movement perspective. So uh, these types of technologies and then how we grapple with them and also the ethics behind them. Because you know, the, when I was at ODNI, we released you know kind of an ethics of artificial intelligence uh, you know kind of framework that I think was a good resource for people to think about. But we're going to have to kind of apply these things when we're thinking about domestically, make sure that they stay in line and, and inside those guardrails that we're comfortable with. I, I, just to get back onto the the prioritization of the IC on what are we doing with malign influence? You have the Center for Malign Influence that 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 was supposed to be established, and if there's a real challenge with establishing that. Have the leadership to come to Congress and tell us what the challenge is. Is there there's, is there a different authority that needs to be given? It's just it's been multiple years. It's not going anywhere. It signals to the American people it's not a priority. No, well, I can talk to you guys all day long. This is great stuff. Uh, we do want to open it up for questions from the audience. So someone's going to have to help me with this uh, as far as uh, recognizing folks for questions. JP Hogan, um, you raise all this and say it's technically legal what someone is doing, but if the first civil liberty is religious freedom and a republic is for people who are under their God before under their government, anyone working with America should be respecting that principle. So if China is here to be secular and socialist, they don't have equal standing as that each citizen is supposed to be protected of that liberty. So I'm wondering where, if you're saying things, they're doing it legally, um, that's, does that give you something to work with as you're puzzling me on how it's being allowed as legal? Can, um, I mean, in terms of, you mean like, what, we, what do we need to do to make that illegal? Well, or? I, I don't know how to stay brief. <laughs> Uh, so this um, China's efforts would be more to be secular in here. It would then raise the question, are they being religious technically, or if what they're doing is more trying to, it's, there should be separation in there. Sure. I know there's a history of people of like, the religious separation was supposed to be, we have faith and secular and they're side by side, but I'm not sure that's the way it works if your rights come from I, I, your crea yeah. creator and your religious liberty. So your free state is freedom in the Judeo-Christian. So yeah, I, th I, th I think, and you guys can kind of follow up on this, but I think it's kind of like the difference between influence and, and, and uh, um, word's gone now, but interference. interference. <laughs> but it's also uh, w individuals have rights to say things, whether that's on social media or any other platform. But when it becomes a campaign, and, and, and a government doing that or someone doing that that is influencing that, then that becomes illegal. And so many times it's very hard, just like interference and influence are hard to determine which is which. Mm -hmm. It's also hard to determine which is a campaign, which is a campaign of war, and which is just an individual's thoughts. And uh, we value uh, First Amendment rights here in America, and I can assure you in China and Russia, we don't get the same opportunity. They don't value the rights of their citizens to speak. And if y'all can follow up, if there's anything that kind of articulates that better. It's certainly one we've, we've struggled with, and I, I think when you look back at some of the examples that we've experienced in the last decade, uh, <clears throat> kind of drawing that line and where, where can we go and what tools do we have, I think it becomes a, what, what authorities do we have and what levers are available to us to kind of pursue some of those, as it's not, a, this is definitely a gray space. Okay, let, let's move to another question, if we can. Uh, I think right here. Actually, Congressman, I just had one quick point okay. I wanted to make on that uh, issue, going off of something Dustin had said about uh, Starlink and, and Elon Musk and all of that actually was very generously uh, funded by U.S. taxpayers through the Department of Energy. So we can take a lot of credit for that. And that capability to uh, shoot broadband access, Internet access from a satellite is new. We developed that after Hurricane Harvey and Maria to be able to get uh, internet access to remote areas. And I do think under the rubric of the First Amendment, we should make that a top priority because we're basically exporting free speech. That's our brand. 
and we could do it offensively, so you could get it into you know, closed countries like China and Iran to allow their, their citizenry to communicate. We have this breaking out in Iran today. They just shut down the internet again uh, to prevent activists from communicating. And we can also do it as a service to partners and allies. I could think of no greater thing we, that we could do for, say, Latin America to help them develop uh, than to say, you know, we're gonna help you to have this capacity. And we can also do it for rural America. So I think that's an area where we can have a very positive impact, as I said, completely consistent with our values and interests that will draw a very bright line between what we are doing and what these malign actors are doing. Yeah, and this lady, please. Thank you so much for having us today, and thank you for having conversations such as these. My first question sort of relates to the international community and your work with the international community as a citizen of Bahrain and as a representative of the embassy of Bahrain, we've seen sort of domestically Iran's malign efforts. And so I'm kind of curious if you could maybe shed more light on how partnerships with the international community kind of develop and sort of having these um, conversations where you share intelligence or looking at sort of a rubric of how certain communities or certain countries deal with international or malign efforts and then sort of taking them as maybe like an American example. And the other being just a more uh, simple one or maybe a more difficult one, what does it look like within, and just, just genuine curiosity, on like a domestic level within the international, having these conversations about the international community or malign um, interference on, on the American citizen, what's the way to sort of engage an American citizen who may not necessarily be within the political sphere about or letting them know about how these things occur? And thank you. Take the last half of that question. I'll defer the first half to one of my, my colleagues. But um, the last half in education, um, I think there was a lot of efforts made. Uh, and a lot of it wasn't made to the average American during the 2018-2020 uh, elections, from my perspective. We really focused our efforts with the state um, secretaries of state who handle elections at each of the different states. And if you've seen and worked with one state, You've seen and worked with only one state. Um, so a lot of time we were doing classified briefings, bringing them in and educating them. And, and it's amazing what the, walk, the takeaway from these were is, oh, really? That, that's what you're going to share with us. It's, it's actually really close to what you're seeing in real time. So how did we break down that wall from 2018 to 2020 to have a more whole, holistic conversation about what it is you're seeing in the malign influence space and how that applies to them? So I think there was a lot of lessons learned there on the elections front that can be taken and applied to general mainstream malign influence across a number of diversity of issues. Uh, and it's really just identifying the right agency, the right leadership to be that point person to carry the water and have credibility, um, whether it's the FBI on issues, whether it is the DNI on other issues. I think the DNI is doing amazing stuff in the uh, critical infrastructure space with trying to highlight issues there. Um, so identifying who that is, and I think that's a discussion that the the executive branch has not really kind of wrapped around and decided how they would do that. I would just say on the, perhaps maybe on the international organization space, right? I think that from, the, at least from China's perspective, like the, the UN is an arena for great power competition for them. And for, for the Chinese personnel as policy, their goal is to transform um, a lot of these international organizations into mouthpieces for China's foreign and defense policy. And so they, make strategically timed investments. They work in overtime to ensure that PRC nationals assume key positions uh, where you can shape the actual, for example, the UN agenda. And for all of the UN's many, many flaws, uh, what goes onto paper uh, directs the UN program of work. And you'll find, for example, China's Belt and Road Initiative um, spread throughout the broader UN agenda. And a portion of that has to do with disinformation and misinformation. And so I think that there has to sort of be a broader recognition here in the United States that these international organizations are an arena in the, the malign influence space when it comes to messaging. And it does require a, a far more concerted US effort to get our people into these positions to contest international organization elections. Uh, because we see time and time again, uh, particularly in the Chinese space, that when there is a PRC national who's a, at the head of these organizations, they put forward uh, Chinese propaganda. And we have to be able, and it's very difficult to counter it if we're not putting up US candidates to challenge them. Or it doesn't have to be a US candidate. It can be a candidate from any country. But maybe it shouldn't be from Russia. Maybe it shouldn't be from China. Maybe it shouldn't be from Iran. 
when do you pick who's the best athlete? And I think if we're thinking about shaping broader narratives around the world, you do have to look at some of these organizations and sit back and say, well, are we really in the game? Um, and how are we using our financial and personnel resources? And I think you would see that we're, we're not doing very well and we're actually not competing uh, when we really, um, I think, could if we, if we put our mind to it. You might, you might even have a candidate from Bahrain yeah. uh, because, I mean, you all, are, as you know, very well on the front lines of the Iranian disinformation campaigns and taking the brunt of that. And, and we have not done a good job of reaching out and coordinating what would be very much what Craig talked about, an, an open source program, you know, that this doesn't even have to be in the SCIF. We could right. do this out of the SCIF uh, with our theme today and, you know, make sure we're communicating to you the patterns that we're seeing, that what we're picking up here, what we think might be being broadcast toward you. And I mean, and this is not isolated to Bahrain. I mean, we literally had our first conversation with the Israelis about this uh, during the previous administration. So this is something we need to get after much more holistically. Uh, so, uh, and I think, I think that could be a critical service the United States could provide. And to chime in just on that too, we have so much to learn from our foreign partners mm -hmm. who are on the receiving end of this propaganda themselves. I would, it would be an amazing bi-directional transfer to say, well, what are you seeing in your media? What are you seeing in your public dose, the public domain and the public space there? Maybe that sounds very, very similar to what another partner is countering um, and trying to or sort of diffuse around the world. Even just that putting the two parties together can be incredibly useful. But we, the challenge of creating this policy in different silos and governments not talking about it is sort of counterproductive because I find that we're all doing it in, in sort of fits and starts. Uh, it's not needed. And my question is that, do you feel any uh, backlash from American people, given that the people who are on left, they tend to buy Chinese point of view on social media, and the people who are on right, especially pro-Trump, they tend to buy Russian uh, point of view. So if U.S. government try to counter that, uh, do you feel that American people would have some backlash about this? Thanks. Well, I, I, I don't know that, that you could make that kind of broad generality. I mean, I served in President Trump's administration for four years, and I think I'm pretty good at spotting Russian disinformation. Uh, and I, I would defer to the congressmen, but I also think there are a lot of, of uh, those on the left who are pretty skeptical of China. So I think you can, you can actually exploit that. Uh, you know, to come to a much broader, more bipartisan uh, consensus on, on this kind of issue. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, we don't have the same opportunities. First of all, we don't do disinformation. Uh, we speak to, the, speak to the truth, and they don't even allow us to tell the truth in their countries. But, but I would argue the American people are much smarter than the Chinese and the Russians give them credit for. And I would say that there is some of this disinformation, and there is influence, and there, there are other opportunities that they use. But for the most part, I think most of the time it comes out that it is disinformation. But what we've got to do is just uh, make sure that when we see a campaign that is successful, I'll tell you, for every 10 that they run, nine are unsuccessful. We've just got to make sure, and in, in a bipartisan manner. And I can tell you, uh, four years ago when I was in Congress, no one ever talked about China and using malign influence and all those things here in America. Everyone ignored the problem. I can tell you in the last three years in a bipartisan way that we have uh, continued to counter uh, Chinese malign influence and Russian malign influence, but it's important. We have to win everyone. Uh, they don't have to win any because we're not doing the same things in their countries. And I'll just piggyback on that uh, and I'll actually recommend a book, uh, but uh, former Secretary of Defense Gates, former CIA director, I uh, wrote a great book called uh, Exercises of Power, uh, and it kind of does a case study of what goes well and what goes right, or what goes well, what can go wrong, uh, depending on the instruments of power uh, of the government. And he goes through kind of case studies historically, especially a ton during his time uh, in the 70s and 80s, but talks about how we've kind of lost some of this kind of muscle memory of, you know, the U.S., we have the U.S. Information Agency. Uh, essentially, all this got rolled back into the State Department and other things, and then Victoria brought this up earlier. We've not really had an effective, in my opinion, uh, capability 
to go broadcast truthful messages uh, about what America's doing and what our adversaries are doing as well. Because uh, if you look at where these, you know, especially the Iranians, the Russians, the Chinese, you know, we talk about it just right now on our domestic side, but go look at the polling of some issues related to anywhere else in the world. I mean, if you go to South America or Africa, the polling on what's happening in Ukraine would blow your mind. And so because they have a hyper effort, because one, you can get more bang for your buck in these types of uh, media markets, um, but they can they can invest a lot of that, and it pays off for them in the long run. And then it, it works also uh, tangentially with all their other economic investments, technology investments, mineral rights. I mean, you you name it. These different types of bureaus of uh, you know that that Craig mentioned, where they're trying to get in these international bodies, uh, it plays into this longer, very uh, insidious. Uh, framework that we're not doing a very good job combating. And that's something I think we need to really tackle going forward that I think our government's kind of been studying it for a while now. But again, back to the book recommendation, I thought Bob did, or Bob Gates did a really good job of rolling through some of our previous successes in this area. So, I think we had a question here. Uh, sir, uh, I'm Ben Yorga and coming from Romania. So we are quite good in Russian and how the Russian is acting in that part. And we saw a pattern. Uh, we call that uh, stupid useful or useful stupids. They are using the people's opinion that are just stacked in the old habits or communist habits and just feed them their messages uh, in the way. And the end, that people are thinking that the Russian messages has exactly their opinion, their biases. How you plan to counteract that? Because we realize that on some point, some people are just thinking that the Russian system is better because they are feeding with the Russian messages online. So how do you plan to counteract that? In Romania, we choose OSINT offensive, but we realize that even this system, this way to counteract the Russian messages online, is became more, let's say, not useful. Why? Because it doesn't matter at the end which is the truth, because they help, they use this OSINT offensive in order to promote, hey, I told you, this is wrong, this is happening wrong. So how do you plan to counteract that? Yeah, I, I think you can start with Ukraine. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the Russians had a uh, malign information plan from the very get-go, and we honored them on that. We did classified stuff. We started letting people know that they were going to attack from the very get-go. Uh, we were telegraphing everything that was going to happen. And so Russia is sitting here going, we're not going to invade. Uh, you know, they're invading us and all those things. And we showed the world that they were lying, and they invaded exactly when we said they were going to invade. And I think most of those countries, I've been to Romania, I've been to Bulgaria, I, I've, I've, I was just in Finland and Sweden. Sweden and, and, and Estonia and all those places. And I can tell you, people who live behind the Iron Curtain, uh, they know the Russian disinformation. So we just have to tell them the truth. We have to declassify things, especially when they're campaign plans, as quickly as possible and get them in the hands of those government because the people, the government will get it out to their people. But it's so important that we out their disinformation every time that they do it and we do it in a quick manner because the people who live behind the Iron Curtain know what kind of uh, propaganda comes out of the Russian government. And you guys may have a comment. Uh, I completely agree, and that's exactly where we've seen success on our side is when we've quickly gotten in front of it, and it's and then the next morning it's not a talking point in the, in the national news. <clears throat> it's oh yeah, that's what that was. Great, it's dis disinformation or it's it's a malign influence. Okay, there's no story there, and it's not even talked about. So for every one of those examples, I think you talked about, there's nine. For every ten, there's nine that are unsuccessful. A lot of them, it's because of that pro early proactive action that you don't. The average American isn't even hearing about it because it's not newsworthy. The only thing I'd add to that is to not underestimate the power of mockery. Uh, and that that is certainly what both the Chinese and the Russians, and to some extent the Iranians, although they're a little less sensitive to it, they fear the most, is, is literally being made fools of. And in some of these more ham-handed efforts, uh, there's a particular Chinese Twitter feed. I don't have enough time to mock it uh, all day. I'm, I'm not on Twitter all day, Kevin. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it it is possible to do that, and that will will freeze them out faster than anything. 
And if there's no more comments, you know, one of the things, too, uh, we don't have time for another question. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we've got to wrap this thing up at 2 o'clock. But we've got to get our businesses here engaged in America. We've got to get the American people and the American business to understand the threats and to identify those threats and be willing to, because they have whole-of-government approaches in China and Russia. They have one person. And listen, the greatness of America is that we have divisions uh, in our politics. And it is also one of our weaknesses. They, uh, in Russia and China, they have one message. Uh, we have multiple messages, but that's good. We, we value our freedom of speeches. So we, uh, I think this is a good start. What a great panel. What great answers. Uh, I, I kind of feel intimidated sitting up here with all these smart people who've uh, spent so many years. But this has been a great opportunity. But we've got to continue to do these things. And we've got to educate the American people and, and people across the world about what is going on. So thank you very much for your participation in the panel and all y'all online thank y'all for watching too and uh with that i think that concludes the show